Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to Eastside Online. Uh, we're glad you could join us this morning. At Eastside, we're about seeking Christ, serving the community together, teaching others, and joining in worship. And happy Mother's Day. Uh, for those of you who have maybe forgotten, you need to remember, you need to FaceTime your mother today while you're in quarantine and tell her you love her. Uh, I, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to do some announcements, and then Rachel is going to lead us in some singing, and then uh, I'll be back with the message. But first, let's go through some announcements. So as you can see, this is the, the front page of our website, eastsideharrisonburg.org. That's a great place for you to get uh, updates and information and find contact information for things that are going on at Eastside. Also, you can connect with us through our app. If you search Eastside Church Harrisonburg on any of the app stores, you can find it. There's uh, some, some great things there. You can fill out prayer request cards there. Uh, you can get information there. You can give directly through that app, and it's a great way to, to stay connected. You can find information about small groups there as well. Maybe the most important uh, email for you to remember is this one, connect at eastsideharrisonburg.org. If you want information or need to get information to us, this email is, is the quickest, easiest way, the easy way to remember how to get a hold of us. One of the things that we would like you to use it for, uh, the, the elders and staff have asked that people set aside money from, from stimulus checks to help those that might be experiencing financial need. If you are experiencing financial need or if you know people that are experiencing financial need, go ahead and contact us through this email. And I just want to thank you guys. You guys have already given over $8,000 to that fund to help people who need it. it you, Eastside, you are so generous. We can't thank you enough. You've been terrific, so thank you. There's other places to, to help out in the community. Hope Distributed is one of those places. Uh, Patchwork Pantry, you can find those places online, how you can help or, or volunteer. Also, if you connect with us for the first time with this email, we want to get you the information that's helpful and we want to continue to help in our community. So if you reach out to us through this email for the first time, we'll make another contribution to the RMH Foundation Crisis Response Fund. Just want to remind you of the, the weekly rhythm that we've started at Eastside during, during lockdown, and, and it's a rhythm that I'm hoping that we'll continue after that as well. Uh, on Mondays, there's going to be something with kids for our, from our children's director, Mia. On Tuesday, Rachel puts out a video that's geared towards worship. There's times of prayer on Wednesday, and uh, Thursday is a chance for you to uh, in, engage in a Bible study led by either myself or Pastor Peter. And Fam Fridays have been a hit. People uh, get to see videos of other family members, uh, what's going on in the life of Eastside family. Sunday we have, uh, obviously, a worship video, and then we join together for communion uh, at noon on Sundays. So here's the information, how you can access that. Grab grape juice, wine, water, bread, crackers, whatever you have. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Communion is a chance for those who are participating in the life of Christ, those who are committed to following Jesus, to sit down and remember that together. It's a great way for families, uh, parents, if you want to talk to your kids about what you're doing and why. This is a great opportunity for you to sit down with them. And, and then together, we're just going to remember Jesus. Even as we're separated, we're remembering that we're one family and we're celebrating the life of Jesus. Uh, Rachel's going to lead us in some singing, and then we'll come back with the message. I'll see you guys in a bit. Good morning, Eastside. Happy Sunday, and welcome to worship this morning. If you all don't mind standing as we sing together and worship this morning, or whenever you're watching this, wherever you are, whether you're in your kitchen or your living room or your den, maybe you're in your car, and it might be harder to stand up there. But um, would you stand and sing with me?
God, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you that you are a miracle worker. You're the God who does things that we can't even imagine, Lord. And um, I think we need to remember that truth now more than ever before. Uh, so we thank you, Lord, for, for who you are. Uh, we pray that as we hear about the importance of relationships today, God, that you would just ready our hearts and our minds, um, that we would be receptive to your word, Lord. Um, we thank you that we see relationship between you as Trinity um, and that you desire a relationship with us too, Lord, and just how beautiful that is. And um, yeah, just how important it is that we take that um, and share it uh, with relationship with others. Uh, God, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. We're in this sermon series called Faith for Exiles. It's based on a book by the same title by Dave Kinneman and Mark Matlock. And so here's what we're looking at. Just as Israel was exiled in Scripture and then as in the New Testament, we're taught to think of ourselves as exiles. So just as they were exiled and inundated with the surrounding culture, so too we find ourselves being pressed on all sides by the culture around us. The difference for us is that that happens digitally, that with all of the different ways that we communicate and information is spread throughout the world, it happens digitally. And so culture presses in on us from all directions. And so we're looking at what it takes to be a resilient disciple in the face of all that pressure. Now you can see here there's uh, five defining factors or practices to being a resilient disciple. It doesn't just happen randomly. It doesn't just happen by chance. It doesn't just happen organically. There are common factors in being a resilient disciple. The research is from uh, researching 18 to 29 year olds, uh, and it's all people who grew up Christian or who grew up participating in church and then looking at how uh, their lives turn out after that. And there's a wide spectrum. 10% of those that grew up in the church are resilient disciples. And these five factors that we're looking at are the five factors that they all have in common, those who are resilient disciples. Number one, they experience intimacy with Jesus. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Last week, Pastor Peter talked about cultural discernment. Today, we're going to talk about meaningful relationships. And then the last two are vocational discipleship and countercultural mission. Uh, I'm going to have Adam Showalter read the scripture for you. He's going to read the scripture, and then we're going to come back. I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, keep us from meaningful relationships, and then I'll turn again to the scripture. So at East Side, we stand for the reading of scripture. So if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. It's a reminder that the Bible is one unified story that points us to Jesus. So would you stand as we read? We're going to be reading Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Romans 12, 9 through 21, if you would please stand. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The first chapter, or, or I'm sorry, the first sentence in the beginning of this chapter says, building meaningful relationships means being devoted to fellow believers we want to be around and become. Now, as we talk this morning, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the outside dynamic of, of not just being around other people in the church, 
But first, it means these meaningful relationships that we're talking about are, are relationships where you want to be like the people that you're around. It doesn't mean that we have to like and enjoy spending time with everybody, but it means that we surround ourselves with people who we want to emulate. We need to understand also that our crisis of discernment that Peter talked about last week, that discernment affects our relationship. Discernment to recognize how the digital world impacts my relationship. Discernment to understand what the, the digital world that we live in, what it does to me in the way that I live in the world in relation to other people. It's really easy to hide behind a screen and screens allow us to interact in ways that help that allow us to avoid doing the hard work of being human so here's what i mean by that it's really easy for me to like somebody's post on facebook or put up the heart emoji instead of tell them face to face how much i love them how much i appreciate them or how much i care about them it's a lot easier to do that behind a screen it's why pornography is so prevalent in our culture because it's easy to do inappropriate things behind a screen rather than face to face. And so what I want to do first is talk about some of the things that keep us from meaningful relationships. And we're in a culture that's isolated, more isolated than we've ever, than we've ever been, and we continue to do things to increase our isolation. I found this statistic mind-blowing. 60 million Americans, 60 million. Now, that's almost one-fifth of our population. 60 million Americans are unhappy with their lives because of loneliness. Think about that for a second. Every five people you know, one of them is unhappy with their life because of loneliness. And that number has doubled in the last 10 years. I think we ought to be paying attention to that. Why is it doubling and why, uh, why are we so lonely and why is it increasing? The second thing, uh, second statistic that was in the book was a study from Denmark of more than a thousand people. And what they found is that frequent Facebook users are more angry, are more depressed and more worried than those who don't use Facebook frequently. More depressed, angry, and worried or anxious than those who don't frequently use Facebook. Now, I got to tell you, I love Facebook. I use it all the time. And that's not the point. I'm not telling you that you should hate Facebook. But what I am telling you is that your relationships on Facebook aren't what we're talking about when we talk about meaningful relationships. The Facebook friends that you have aren't, those relationships aren't meaningful relationships. And if they are meaningful relationships, they're probably meaningful because of face-to-face -face relationship you had beforehand. Now, I know there's exceptions, but in general, I think that's the case for most of us. This was the other thing that, that just, it, it's mind-boggling to me. 41% of Christians say, I believe my spiritual life is entirely private. This is not just like the population. 41% of Christians say, I believe my spiritual life is entirely private. I want you to know that you can't be a Jesus follower and have that opinion. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm not saying that to look, look down my nose at anyone. If we take the things that Jesus said, somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest command? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second Jesus offered is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So if that's the only thing that we had record of Jesus saying, that's enough to tell us that my spiritual life is not entirely private because it affects how I treat the person around me. So you cannot say that I believe my spiritual life is entirely private if you're a Jesus follower. And the second one, 37% of people want to be discipled on their own. You know who I bet wanted to be discipled on their own? I bet the Apostle Peter would have loved to be discipled on his own because then those 11 other guys wouldn't have kept seeing him make the same mistakes over and over. But that wasn't his option. You see, Jesus comes and he, he invites us all to follow. And when he invites us all, we don't have the option of going alone. 
We all go together in following after Jesus. We continue to try to isolate ourselves as disciples of Jesus, and we can't. It doesn't work. It's not, that's, that's not how this works. I was watching, again, uh, a TED Talk the other day from Brene Brown. And she said in that talk that we are the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated group of adults in U.S. history. We numb ourselves because of the things that we experience in life. But here's the thing that she said. She said, when we numb, we numb everything. And it's really hard to, to either build new relationships or, or continue existing relationships or strengthen weak relationships. It's really hard to do that when we've numbed ourselves. The, the, the title there on the slide is Comfortably Numb. As I was listening and thinking about this, I thought of the, the Pink Floyd song, Comfortably Numb. Don't, I'm not a Pink Floyd fan. I just I, I thought of it. Here's the first line of Comfortably Numb. Hello, is there anybody out there? When we numb ourselves, we isolate ourselves. It's almost, uh, it's almost as if we have this problem as humans. You see, we're, we know more than ever before. We have more knowledge and more knowledge available to us than ever before. And yet, our mental health is declining. We know more than ever, and yet our mental health is declining. It's almost as if humans have a habit of reaching out for things. Think of Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve reaching out for the tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. It's almost as if we keep grasping for knowledge, but knowledge isn't the thing that we most need. We know more than ever in our mental health is continuing to decline. Listen, you can't do it on your own and have it be church. If you can do it on your own, it isn't church. Uh, the word that you see there on your screen, ecclesia, is the Greek word that's translated church in your Bibles. And, and this word ecclesia is just a word that the biblical authors took from Greek culture and used to talk about the church, and it means assembly. And so you see that play out in Scripture. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is being brought before like a city council. He's being brought before people, and it, it, it's the assembly. And that word, ecclesia, is used there. He's not being brought before the church. He's being brought before a public assembly of people who are called out for that task. And that's exactly what we are as the church, a group of people called out into the public, into the public arena for a task. And that task is to make God known. But if you can do it by yourself, it's by definition of the word, not ecclesia and not church. If you can do it on your own, it is an ecclesia. One other thing that I thought about as I was preparing for this and thinking about uh, the things that keep us from meaningful relationship, shame came to mind again. And uh, the cover of a book there that's been important to me over the last couple of years, I keep returning to it. It's called The Soul of Shame by Kurt Thompson. Kurt Thompson lives in Northern Virginia, so you can, he's got a blog and a podcast. You can, you can find him. This book is so good. And so think back to Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and it says they're naked, and they feel no shame. And then in Genesis chapter 3, they reach for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They, the sin enters their life. God comes to walk with them in the garden, and they're, they're suddenly now ashamed, and they hide. They go and isolate themselves. They, they go away from God, and they feel the need to cover themselves. You see, before they were without shame and naked, and now they recognize their nakedness. They see what their condition is, and they try to hide. And so shame ultimately is this, this idea and it's often an emotion, it's often a gut feeling, it's often a response or a reaction before we can put any words to it. 
And what, it, what shame is at its, at its basics, basic level is that other people are going to see me for who I really am, and they're going to leave. So Adam and Eve are naked, and they're worried about being seen for who they really are in their nakedness, and they're afraid. But here's the thing that we do when, as human beings, what we tend to do when we experience shame, when that, when that gut feeling starts to creep in, I tend to move away from rather than towards. And it doesn't matter if it's God or other people. When I sense and experience that shame, I tend to move away rather than towards. Now, here's the thing. Shame, it, it's, it's a thing where I'm worried that other people are going to see me and leave and not want to be part of my life. But my reaction to it is to back away. And so it becomes this ugly cycle that we continue to live out. And then if we're doing the things that Brene Brown reminded us that we do, we're in debt, obese, addicted, medicated. We experience shame about those things and we pull back and we isolate and it's an ugly cycle that continues to repeat itself. So whether it's Kurt Thompson or whether it's Brene Brown, vulnerability, courage, And moving towards in relationship is the only way, the only way to combat the shame that we experience. So two things when it comes to building or forging meaningful relationships. Now remember, these are meaningful relationships. These are not Facebook relationships. These are meaningful relationships. Number one, if you feel well-connected, you need to look for people who aren't well-connected. If you feel well-connected, you need to look for people who aren't well-connected because remember, one of every five people you know is dissatisfied with their life because of loneliness. You need to look for the people who aren't connected. And number two, if you feel alone, you need to attempt to connect. And I'm not putting all the responsibility on you, but what I'm, what I'm saying is this. If you feel alone, then the way to combat that is to, to move towards. And, and some of us, we don't, because being alone is often a thing that causes us to experience shame and we try to hide the fact that we're lonely, the rest of the people around you don't always see very well that you're lonely because you're hiding it. And so what we need is both sets of people, those who are well-connected reaching out to others and those who feel lonely to be courageous and vulnerable and step forward and try to reach out because the reality is this. I need you to help me better reflect the image of Christ. And you need me and the others around you to help you better reflect the image of Christ And we all have to work together to make sure that happens. Now, this text that that we read is so good. And and so I want to take a little time talking about it because I think it has so much to teach us about relationships. And I love this text because there's there's an inside the church family dynamic and an outside the church family dynamic. And so we'll get to the outside in just a minute. Here's the other, the, the second thing that I want you to know about this text because Uh, In English, it doesn't come through quite the way that it does in, in, I almost said Spanish, but it's not. It's Greek. So it almost doesn't come through the same way. So here's what I want you to know. So we're looking at the NIV right now, and verses 9 through 13 are eight, eight, I have to count on my fingers. There's eight different sentences in English, but in Greek, it's one sentence. Verses 9 through 13 is one sentence, and so it's love... Paul says to the Roman church, love, and then he goes on and gives a bunch of qualifiers and descriptive, descriptors. So it's love must be sincere, comma, 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 chameleon. Sorry, that was, I got distracted. It's all these descriptors for what love is and looks like. So the word is love, right? Agape. It's self-giving, self-sacrificial love that prefers somebody else over yourself. Am I right, Tony Dean? That's what agape is. Love must be sincere. And the Greek word for sincere there is, uh, it's, in English, it's hypocrite, but it's the same Greek word. And what hypocrite was in Greek was an actor, just a person who acts in a play. 
And so what Paul is saying is that love must be, it's not a show. Like you legitimately give yourself for other people because you prefer them over yourself. You're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to give. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. The word devoted here, it's so interesting. We just talked about agape. There's four different Greek words for love. There's agape, which is self-giving, self-sacrificial love. There's eros, which is um, romantic or erotic love. There's phylos, which is brotherly love, or like think David and Jonathan in the Old Testament, like BFF love, like this is I love this person as my friend. And then there's the word storge, which is familial love. Like, it's Mother's Day. I love my mom because she's my mom. No, like, I just, I love her because she's my mom. And this word right here, be devoted to one another in love, it's just phylos and stor- storge stuck together. And so what Paul is saying is self-sacrificial love is love that gives of itself, but then you love people like they're your BFF and you love people like they're your mother and you're devoted to them and you are never lacking in zeal. Think of this. What do you think of when you think of, uh, of a zealot, somebody who's zealous? Paul's saying, be zealous, be a zealot in the way that you go after other people and love them self-sacrificially and love them like your best friend and love them like your mother. Be zealous in that. Be joyful in hope. Joy is awareness of God's grace. It's being aware of all that God has done for us. Be joyful in hope. Hope hope is not a feeling. Hope is not an emotion. Hope is in Jesus. Hope is a person. So when I live my life like Jesus taught, when I recognize that Jesus died, that he was resurrected, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for me, that's hope. And it's not a feeling, it's a trust in who Jesus is. Hope is a person. Be joyful in knowing your relationship with Jesus. Be patient in affliction. Be be faithful in prayer. Love doesn't stop praying for each other. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. You guys are doing that. You're so generous. Practice hospitality. This word, again, it's it's philo xenos. It's, It's brotherly, best friend love for xenos. Strangers, foreigners, love strangers and foreigners. This text is so full, so rich. Bless those who persecute you. It's where we get the word eulogize or eulogy. It means to speak well. So speak over the people who are persecuting you, right? We're starting to turn outside the family of God. Sometimes persecution happens inside the family of God. Either way, bless, speak good over those who have persecuted you or who are persecuting you. Don't speak evil or cursing. Speak good over them. Don't speak evil. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. When you go through something awesome, when you experience something amazing, what do you want more than anything? You want somebody right beside you to experience it with you. And when you mourn, when you go through difficult things, what do you need more than anything? You need somebody who's there with you in the trenches with you, to go with you through whatever you're going through. And Paul continues, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Be willing to to get in the trenches with whoever. People of low position, don't be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Wait, what? What? Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Paul, okay, you lost, okay, I understand you want me to be nice to people, but you lost me here. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Bring up vaccines in a conversation online and see what happens. Because I guarantee that 50% of the people, you will not be right in their eyes. Here's what Paul would have you to know. 
If you live out verses 9 through 16, if you're zealous in your love for people, if you give of yourself for other people and if you prefer them and if you live like they're your best friend and you love them like you love your mom and you're zealous in your love for them and you continue to associate and walk through things in life with people of low position and if you continue to, to reach out to people and if you continue to build those do you know what's going to happen? People are going to look at you and you go, you know what, I may not agree with you on this, but you're all right with me. The people in my life that I know that have, have treated me like that, they, look, I, I'll say, look, this sounds a little conspiracy theory-ish to me, but you're okay with me because that's, I know how you've treated me and that's the kind of person that I want to be around. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Can we trust that God can hand out punishment if it needs to be handed out? I'm not talking about justice. I'm not saying we weren't, shouldn't work for justice. I'm saying it's not our job to work for retribution. And those two things are different. Can we trust that if punishment needs to be handed out, God can take care of it? On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. All right, now we're, we're clearly talking about people that probably aren't part of our church family. If your enemy, enemy, not just some dude, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him give him something to drink. Paul is simply quoting Proverbs right now. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I read this week that there's, a, there's an ancient Egyptian practice of uh, when somebody does something wrong and they're willing to admit it and repent, they would wear something on their head with burning coals in it. It's a sign to everyone else around, I was wrong and I'm willing to change. I'm willing, I'm willing to to, to eat my words, to, to switch my position because I was wrong. And that's what Paul is saying. When we can live a life like he's just described, people will be moved and they will turn. Not everyone, but when we live a life like Paul is saying, we have the opportunity to build relationships that become meaningful. And it's important because in a world that's becoming more and more isolated, we need as, as resilient disciples, not only do we need it, but we need to help the world that's becoming more and more isolated. Look, we'd love for you to go through these, uh, this sermon series as small groups and go through these sermons as small groups. And here's uh, what I have here are some, are some goals, but I've asked them as questions because I think they're a great way for us to begin to, to identify and to think about how things are happening in our lives and in our church family. Are we making resilient disciples through meaningful relationships? First, am I confident in my relationships at church? Not just do I have relationships, Am I confident in my relationships? In other words, I'm going to use, I'm going to use my small group leader as an example, Nevin, because uh, I love him and I think he loves me. But here's the thing. Am I confident in my relationship with Nevin? If Nevin sees something in my life that he thinks doesn't reflect well the image of Christ and he comes to me, am I going to hear it? Am I going to receive it without writing off Nevin, without breaking relationship with Nevin? That's confidence in a relationship? And, and do I have confidence that if I saw something in Nevin, I could go to him and say, Nevin, hey, I think this is something in your life that doesn't reflect the image of Christ and, and not expect him to turn and walk away because he doesn't like what he heard. That's confidence in relationship. Am I confident in my relationships at church? Do I feel connected to people of all ages in my church? I didn't really talk about the intergenerational part uh, of building relationships this morning, simply because we live in a world where it's so hard just to forge relationships, meaningful relationships, that I didn't want to, that would have been a, another direction altogether. But do I feel connected to people of all ages in my church? Am I mentored by someone older and do I mentor someone younger? 
Are there people in our church family who look at you and when they look at you, they think there's somebody who cares about me and there's somebody who I want to be like? Are there younger people who look at you and think that? And are there older people that you look at and you think, I know they care about me and that's somebody that I want to be like? And look, it's tough to build those relationships, but again, like everything else, it takes vulnerability and courage and just being willing to say, hey, you're somebody who I can learn from. Is it okay if I spend time with you? I want, I want to, to see how you live your life. I want to continue to be mentored by you. Do I know how to appropriately use digital tools to aid my relationships? Look, again, I want to reiterate, we are not against technology. Technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, like, it is not the irony that we're talking about meaningful relationships and we can't be together. It's not lost on me. Ryan's got new toys all over this building so that we, in a technological way, can continue to do the things that we do and we can continue to talk about Scripture together. But am I using digital tools to aid my relationships because digital tools can aid my relationships and they can inhibit my relationships. Do I know how they're inhibiting my relationships? If I'm relying on digital tools as the, the means for my relationship, it's probably inhibiting your relationship. Look, and this is why this is so important. We've used this image over and over again because it's, it's meaningful to us. At Eastside, we think of ourselves as rescued rescuers. And you can't help rescue other people without meaningful relationships. You can't do it. We're, uh, we're, not, just, we're not just pulling people from danger into safety. We're pulling people into life, the life of Christ that is our hope that we can, be, we can be joyful in hope, we can be patient in affliction. And we, if we can't forge meaningful relationships with people, then we can't offer meaningful relationships. Listen, I want to finish up by just saying two things. Uh, last week, somebody asked me a question. They said, Matt, how is the church doing all of this? And I just like laughed. I'm like, because my... My sarcastic response was, Norm, I don't know. I can't talk to anybody. And then I had to sit for a moment and think. And here's what I think. Here's how I hope the church is doing. Here's how I pray the church is doing. But here's how I hope and pray that the church moves forward from where we're at. And it's this. Number one, I hope that we as the church, as the family of God, don't ever again take for granted the privilege it is to meet together. I hope that when we come out of this, we don't ever take for granted the privilege that it is to meet together. That's number one. Number two, I hope that, what, that, I hope that the church realizes that what we have to offer is the church. I hope that the church realizes that what we have to offer is the church. I'm not like Obviously, Jesus, right? We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are his body. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm not, I'm trying, I'm not minimizing Jesus, y'all. Jesus is the most important thing. But I hope that we realize that what the church has to offer is the church. You and me. Human relationships. What we have to offer is human relationships. And if we don't get that, if we don't get that, we can't be the body of Christ. We can't continue to be rescued rescuers. Guys, I love you. I can't wait till we can do this again in person. I pray that, that you're well. I pray that you're healthy. God be with you until we meet again. We'll see you later.
Gloria al Padre. Gloria. 